mainly seen as a fashion accessory, a piece of fabric fixed like a wreath of flower on the head. Traditionally associated with the feminine nature of African women, while hiding many messages according to the way in which it is knotted. Some people speculate of about 50 different tying techniques, but sadly, there is no authoritative reference or documentation on the names of the models and their meanings. Where, when, and how head wraps are styled may represent wealth, ethnicity, spirituality, marital status, mourning, or reverence. Today, we are diving into the heart of the history of a symbol that stood the test of time and space, just like African cultures did across the world, despite transatlantic slave trade, various migrations and globalization, a symbol that materially links westernized black women with the traditions of their ancestors and with their cousins across the Atlantic. It is also a symbol that is increasingly readapted by new generations in search of their identities and connection to the continent. Dear passengers, good morning and let's welcome our new captain. African History Daily by my daddy. Hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm 30 and I'm from Mali and Guadeloupe, a French territory. I currently live in France. Those words that you just heard are from our captain, Stephanie Fatumata, aka Your Rap Your Style on social media. And as you could hear, she symbolizes fairly well the itinerary that was imposed to this African accessory called head wrap or turban nowadays, depending on where you are. If you are in a country with Yoruba cultures, such as Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Ghana, then these artfully folded wraps are called geles. In those cultures, a married woman will point her knot to the right, while a single woman will point it to the left. Some tribes in Ghana call theirs dukus. Many South African and Namibian women often use the African's word doek. And finally, in many regions, some say it has a mystical origin and a protective function of the head. The head seen as the first upper part of the body to be affected by bad spells. For thousands of years, African women have worn a vast array of many different head wraps and hairstyles throughout many different regions on the entire continent. Dutch traveler Peter de Maras was so impressed that he actually documented in a book in which he made a very detailed description of about 16 different hairstyles, some of which included head wraps in the region of Guinea alone. Despite the initial positive meaning when African women were wearing them, head wraps have also been used as a means of suppressing women. For example, in the 18th century in Louisiana, three mixed race Creole communities served as a buffer class between powerful white and enslaved blacks. But as French and Spanish men sought and forced relationships with women of color, race and class lines became increasingly obscure. In 1785, Spanish colonial governor Esteban Rodriguez Miro mandated that Afro-Creole women wear what is called tignon, a turban-like head wrap, to undermine their exotic look. Tignon laws, as they are called, aimed to reaffirm the social order by marking women of color differently. Afro-Creole women protested, decorating their tignons with jewels, ribbons, and fevers. Ultimately, the tignon became a defiant fashion statement for free women of color. In Afro-Creole culture, head wrap traditions are a classical example of turning lemons into lemonade in spite of oppression. Throughout the southern states in America, South America and Caribbean, many slave masters required enslaved black women to wear head coverings. Headscarves served functional purposes like protecting women's scalps from the sun, sweat, grime and lice. There were also symbolic markers indicating a slave's inferiority in the social hierarchy of the time period. But enslaved black women found many creative ways to resist. For example, in parts of Central America like Suriname, black women use the folds in their headscarf to communicate coded messages to one another that the masters could not understand. After the United States abolished slavery in 1865, 
some black American women continued to wear head wraps creatively. However, the style ultimately became associated with servitude and domestication. The mass production of typical mummy images like Aunt Jemima wearing a checkered hair tie reinforced such stigmas. To assimilate into the dominant culture, many middle class and upwardly mobile black women began embracing Eurocentric standards for beauty and professionalism. And as a result, wearing headscarves in public largely fell out of favor in early 20th century black communities. During the 1970s, head wraps became a central accessory of a black power uniform of rebellion. The head wrap, like the afro, defiantly embraced a style once used to shame people of African descent. Black is beautiful, the saying went, and kente cloth head wraps were Afrocentric aesthetic celebration. In the 1990s and 2000s, artists like Erika Badu, Lauren Hill and India Airy popularized colorful and towering wraps for a new generation. Just as the new soul genre repackaged black music style like jazz, hip-hop and R&B, these artists' head covering paid tribute to a long, rich history of black hair culture. While the style was new and unfamiliar to many outside the African diaspora, head wraps quickly entered the mainstream. On this iconic episode of Season Street, Erika Badu uses her head wrap to teach children about acceptance and cross-cultural friendship. My African cliché of the day is a question to you. Do you think that if a white American lady chooses to wear a head wrap, is it cultural appropriation? Is it paying tribute? Is it respect? Is it free advert for that culture? Before you respond, let me define this term. Cultural appropriation refers to when a dominant culture appropriates the codes of a dominated one, either the colonized people or the oppressed minorities. So, is it respect when it is done for fun and money while erasing the cultural side of it? Like wearing a Palestinian kefir pattern without ever mentioning the pain of the people? Is it tribute when it's about everything but the burden, when it's like entering and living a culture without bearing the burden and using the codes without suffering? And where is the respect when big brands use those cultures' material and symbols to produce gadgets and goodies to enrich themselves and their advertising icons? Now I guess I can let you respond and until we meet again for the second leg of this Sankofa flight. Thank you and goodbye.